So I've also renamed this. It uh, used to have a long name like Lifestyles or something like that. If you go to your uh, prospective employer and he says, so what did you study? And you say whatever the title used to be, Lifestyles and Domestic Life or whatever, he won't know what that is. He or she won't know what that is. But if you say housing, yes. Did you study housing? Yes, I studied housing. Um, so I renamed it something that you would recognize and that the world would recognize upon graduation. This is a, a very deep and powerful topic. Whenever someone accuses you as an architect of being elitist, detached, too artistic for your own good, all you have to do is refer to the fact that architects deal with housing, Housing deals with everything. Housing is political. Housing is economic. Housing is social. Housing is life. The reconstruction of the world is through the reconstruction of housing. As this example of Hausman's uh, section through the boulevard housing type uh, testifies. So I've amended the syllabus in my computer, but that didn't automatically change your paper copy. I apologize, we're not that sophisticated. But um, please make note, I've added uh, to this lecture topic the two chapters from the second textbook, Modern Architecture. Well, that's right, that's out of print. You don't own it. So I'm going to have to scan that and add it. Uh, chapter 14 is already uh, part of the Blackboard upload, but I will also scan chapter 24 and make that part of the Blackboard upload in case that's one of the areas where you want to dig in a little more deeply. Because remember, even when we taught housing as a full semester course, uh, or two courses for a full semester, uh, it's still inadequate to the larger task of doing housing. Uh, I apologize for not preparing you for a career as an architect dealing with housing, but even if we still had those two courses, you would have to spend the rest of your life career uh, filling in the gaps. And um, that is especially true since we're trying to do so much in one class. So let's get to it. We begin our story by looking at the Industrial Revolution. And there's no secret that uh, when, especially in England, they switched from water-powered factories to coal-powered factories, and from water transportation to coal-powered locomotive, steam locomotive transportation, there was a lot more coal being mined out of the ground and a lot more coal being burned. Uh, some would say this was the beginning of the Anthropocene era, where we started to burn fossil fuels in significantly higher qualities. There's that quantities. There's that word again, Anthropocene. I told you you'd hear it again. Um, and so we start with a critique of the industrial city. Uh, it wasn't just polite critique. It was violent revolution. Uh, the French Revolution was in part uh, due to the poverty of peasants. Uh, and as the world industrialized, the marginalization of poor people got worse and worse and worse. Factory workers uh, were paid uh, barely enough to survive. Uh, at around the same time as the Industrial Revolution uh, rose, slavery was going down. Uh, Critical historians of capitalism would point out low wage labor is really just slavery in a slightly cloaked form. Um, make up your own mind. Um, the Communist Manifesto and the uh, Socialist Revolution that rocked uh, the world in the 20th century was started in the 19th century when a fa the son of a factory owner went to work in his father's factory in Manchester, England. And he noticed the horrible conditions. Uh, and that was the beginning of uh, a partnership between uh, the 
uh, Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx, which gave us the Communist Manifesto. Um, we're also going to look at the critical photography of Jacob Rees uh, briefly in New York. So there's a, and this list could go on and on and on. These are just some of the most poignant historical landmarks uh, of people making note of how destructive the Industrial Revolution was on uh, social structures and the environment and society. Um, one of the interesting uh, moments where architectural tools turned out to be extremely effective uh, forever, for centuries, large populations, I mentioned in the previous lecture, the last lecture, that uh, large populations every few years would be lost to cholera epidemics uh, in high, high density uh, residential neighborhoods and cities. And it was thought that uh, these diseases were passed through smell. So if you could smell something bad, that meant you were at risk of being infected, and that transformed the way architects and builders uh, created cities. Um, it turned out that it wasn't the air, it was the water. And the way uh, we found that out is that Jon Snow, not the one from Game of Thrones, but Dr. Jon Snow uh, had a theory, and to prove his theory, he did a spatial visualization, otherwise known as a map, and he just made a mark wherever someone died. And he noticed that these uh, dead people were clustered around uh, a public pump on Broad Street, right there. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? So that's the pump. And uh, as soon as he showed this map to the local magistrate, he got permission to go down there and pull the handle off the pump so no one could pump from this particular well because sewage was seeping into the well water and causing all this death. Here's a poverty map uh, from a few years later showing exactly what Friedrich Engels was talking about. Friedrich Engels tells the story of wealthy factory owners taking the carriage from the wealthy neighborhoods of the factory owners uh, through the streets, through the high streets of the typical English factory town, and on either side seeing shops uh, with lots of things for sale, um, and these shops are marked in red. And so this is, these are signs of wealth and the consumer culture. And then behind these shop facades, behind this thin layer of shop facades, are the very cramped uh, quarters of the working poor. And he was saying that our cities in England in 1843 are basically uh, shrouded, uh, the, we have a false facade, we have a thin veil of uh, attractive shops covering a world of misery for all the workers who live behind it. And so uh, this was the focus of a lot of discontent. Laborers would go on strike and would be shot. Uh, these are the kinds of living conditions in those back alleys where each of these uh, squares with an H it represents uh, a, uh, an apartment, and it would be filled with people. Um, sometimes they would rent out the beds by the hour um, and have uh, constant people coming in and out to sleep. Shared bathrooms here, a lot of stink, a lot of unhealthy conditions. Um, here's the Jacob Rees uh, photographic uh, work where he, this is in New York City, he documented the squalor uh, and poverty and if you saw Gangs of New York, uh, this is around the same time. Uh, Flophouse, an early version of Airbnb. Uh, and they would do the work in the, in the tenement units themselves uh, and they would cluster closest to the window because these apartments, we're going to look at some plans of these apartments. Uh, uh, because of the belief, uh, even after John Snow's map, people still thought that air and light were the keys to reducing disease. And so uh, they passed a series of laws about 
the number of windows and how every room needed to have a window. Most rooms have to have a window. And so the work would happen where the light is best. Um, and so these squalid conditions of the Industrial Revolution uh, inspired architects and philanthropists and uh, churches and religious movements uh, and social reformers to uh, try to do something about it. And I summarize some of the movements we're going to look at here. Um, the first one and the last one are both books. So this book, Utopia, by Thomas More, who's read it? Some people read it in middle school. Oh, okay. So uh, the Utopia of Thomas More, and then a more, uh, in 1888, it was one of the uh, hottest selling uh, pieces of fiction in, uh, of the age. Uh, a guy goes to sleep in 1888, or, and then he wakes up in the year 2000 in Boston. And he's totally confused about this wonderful world of Boston in the year 2000. And um, he's constantly asking questions, and that's the book. So the utopian socialism of the future. Um, this is a quick summary that I found online that is quite interesting um, that I'm just passing through. Uh, one of the utopian socialist communities uh, that engaged in the question, what is the relationship between residential housing and factory work? Uh, one of them is something we've already studied, Ledoux's uh, salt works, Royal Salt Works at Show in France. Um, and he puts the director's house right at the center, and it's a panopticon arrangement. And interestingly, uh, the housing is for extended families. He puts four families together, and they cooperate in uh, taking care of the children and the household chores. And this was actually built. Another very important one uh, came a bit later. Uh, Charles Fourier was a philosopher who uh, felt that we needed to change everything, um, not just uh, how we uh, employ people, but also we have to change um, the way uh, factories are set up and we have to change the way we live. And uh, he was the first person to used the word feminism uh, in 1837. And he uh, tried to collectivize a lot of the domestic drudgery of, of home life. Um, in, and he used the word phalanx, which is the Greek uh, military term for a squadron. And so people would work in squadrons to take care of work and domestic things. And it would happen in a single building that was described in 1808 and then visualized in 1834. Um, along these lines, it's like a big hotel with collectivized uh, dining, collectivized daycare, collectivized shops, and everything would happen in these, this single building. And people would stroll along the primary corridors on the bottom floor as if it's a street. And this is um, what it looks like in the 1834 visualization. In the United States, these ideas uh, were picked up by uh, social reformer Robert Owen, and he worked with an architect to envision a utopian new community that did a very similar thing, that uh, collectivized living uh, domestic arrangements uh, and work arrangements, uh, and people would eat together uh, people, the child care was collectivized. Um, in all of these, because they're run by men, there's a lot of free sex. Uh, it's often a, a feature of this. Um, uh, but also packaged in there, an elevation of women's rights. But um, watch out uh, in these collectivized communities. Uh, and they were, all of them had, uh, they were, there was kind of a consensus on the ideal number of people, of, of about 1,200 people. This one lasted a grand total of four years. Um, none of these really worked out very well. Um, and this, it was all done in Gothic Revival style because, again, as Pugin and Ruskin uh, told us uh, in uh, England, uh, Gothic Revival architecture 
and its arrangements helps remind people to act morally and with a religious fervor. Uh, and here's another visualization of it. Uh, salt air, we saw this going by very quickly. I pointed out the housing back here and the factory here and the rail lines and the water, the river here, the church here. This was, uh, uh, Sir Titus Salt was the, a wealthy philanthropist and factory owner and he thought that he could create a new factory town from scratch so he moved all his operations to a new location and he uh, set this up as an ideal arrangement of a large mill building here. Uh, this is the smokestack indicates that we're past the water power age and we're into the coal powered age even though there is a mill river right here. Uh, the church, the, the worker housing, uh, the, the town hall here, uh, the civic institutions, and the larger homes of maybe the supervisors. Uh, and then in here somewhere you could find schools, uh, cemetery. So this was uh, something that was copied all over the place. As a matter of fact, I suspect some of you recognize this arrangement. Do you see something here you recognize? Some of you grew up in towns that look an awful lot like this. There's a big brick building with railroad tracks and a river and a lot of terrace housing like this. Lawrence, Nashua, Haverhill, Lowell. You name the town in New England and it's basically a variation on this model that uh, Salt set up in England. More views of it. Inside the factory. This could be Lawrence. This, not so much. We also looked at Hausman. Hausman, uh, I'm trying to go in chronological order. Hausman's transformation of Paris was another response to the plight of the industrial city uh, that we saw. Um, and this is a housing scheme that was very much a part of the transformation of Paris. It had a social agenda. It had a relationship between the residential fabric and the working fabric uh, of people uh, had a relationship to transportation, civic and social institutions. Now, uh, Hausman, when he was indicted, and uh, I think he went to jail, um, the next person who came along was Eugene Ennard, uh, who became a very important designer, urban designer and planner for the city of Paris. He came up with some really um, fantastical ideas having to do with subways and the mechanization of the city uh, that uh, came to become a reality in the 20th century. Um, and we'll hear more about Inard uh, in a few minutes. Um, the Falenstere of Fourier didn't get built by Fourier, but it was built by others. It, uh, his writing uh, triggered uh, an outpouring of social, civic-minded, utopian, socialist groups all over the English-speaking world, including the United States. And in some places, they built versions of it. This is one in France, uh, where you see the factory across the river over here, and then you see this large hotel-like structure where uh, there are collectivized uh, collectivized uh, domestic arrangements and civic institutions as well. Um, the, again, this was produced by a factory owner uh, who produced uh, cast iron stoves and other cast iron items as you see here. And the work was collectivized as well as the living arrangements. Um, and the interior courts were interiorized through this cast iron, of course, because this is a cast iron factory, they used cast iron uh, vaulting to uh, cover over the, uh, the courtyards. Or is it 
or is it uh, wrought iron? I'm not sure. I'm not seeing arches, so it could be wrought iron. We also talked about Vienna Ringstrasse. Ringstrasse is the ring street, uh, is German for ring street in Vienna, Austria. Uh, we talked about it before, uh, about the importance of having open fields of fire beyond your city walls. And so here are the open fields of fire before the Ringstrasse was installed, and here it is after the Ringstrasse. Thought, um, we'd follow up and, and show you the before and after. And you can start to see the, the use of the grid in the infill parts of the ring, the shifting direction of the grid, almost like a hexa hexagon. And then the more random uh, organic form of the streets inside the uh, medieval walls of Vienna. And Vienna took the opportunity to uh, inject into that new area a new kind of housing which was very much inspired by the French uh, social uh, structure, stratification of the apartments and these new boulevards and streetcars and it's still there today. Uh, and even though on the inner block you have a lot of the older fabric. Uh, but here's one of the housing arrangements that were innovated for uh, Vienna's Ringstrasse, where you have uh, the main rooms of the apartments facing the street or the courtyard, I guess this would be the street out here, or a major mid-block courtyard, and then smaller courtyards so that the bedrooms have access to light and air. Uh, the bathrooms, not so much. This uh, experiment was was reproduced in cities throughout Europe and the United States. This is Berlin's version called Amitz Kaserne. I'm probably not pronouncing that right. Amitz Kaserne. So a, um, a tenement. And it produces this type of urban fabric. So throughout, uh, there's a sense of here's the apartment design, here's how the apartment design agglomerates into a building plan and a building, uh, the three-dimensional aspects of the building because often the ground floor is different than the upper floors. And then, in turn, the form of the apartment design, just as the form of the apartment design has an impact on the building design, the building design has an impact on the block design. The block design has an impact on the experience of the streets of the city. And so when you go to Berlin, and many of you will go to Berlin, uh, you will get a sense. You'll leave Berlin with a sense of Berlinness. And your sense of Berlinness will come from the fact that this some version of this was the apartment plan, this was the three-dimensional arrangement, this was the block arrangement, and it resulted in the streets of Berlin having a very specific feel. And this is uh, the typical Berlin block typology. And you have these corridors on the ground level connecting through from courtyard to courtyard, and these become social spaces. They don't just let light and air into the courtyards. They also let light and air into the rooms that are facing the courtyard. And uh, they create a very specific kind of quality of the city and its streets. New York uh, adopted a grid pattern. We already talked about Jefferson uh, establishing in 1784, the Jeffersonian grid, the land ordinance of 1784 for the development of lands west of the Appalachians. Uh, by 1811, the grid thing was seeming to be a good idea, in part because you could sell land without anyone ever seeing it, because every lot is the same size and configuration. They applied that idea to cities. Uh, with similar uh, and arguably even more fantastic impact that uh, long before there was any realistic sense that Manhattan would become an important place, it was possible to buy land without ever setting foot anywhere near New York. Um, 
This is an area of the East Village. Who's been there? Tompkins Square Park, where uh, we see in the, uh, the 19th century fire insurance maps uh, by Bromley, uh, we see the housing types. That these are tenements. These are five-story walk-up tenements for the factory workers uh, in the factories along the East River to the right here. And uh, they, in order to get air into the units at all, you had to have very shallow units. But eventually, uh, landowners wanted to get more money. Can't blame them. Uh, welcome to America. And so they started building rear units um, facing uh, a much smaller open space. And so there were party walls around three sides of these rear units and, a, and one wall of windows in this very narrow open space in front. And um, the front building would have uh, four windows onto the street and four windows onto the rear yard. And, um, and so the original conception would be like this. And then uh, before 1850, they were allowed to build a second building in the back. And so uh, these bedrooms had no uh, access to light and air at all. So there'd be one apartment on the back side and one apartment facing the street an open court, and then eventually another building would be built back here. Um, in 1850, they passed a law saying you can't do that. Uh, you have to do something like this. And so they would have two apartments on the back, two apartments on the front. These four bedrooms uh, had no uh, access to light and air. These kitchen dining room units would only have access to light and air through the living room, which is to the present, that's still an acceptable arrangement. But wait a minute, where's the bathroom? You see the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? Uh, walk down the stairs and go into the back. There's an outhouse in the back lot. So then uh, in 1879, uh, they pass a law. They say this is unacceptable. Uh, there's a revolution in Paris. Uh, but this is New York, but they hear about it, and they say, we've got to improve the housing. So most of the Lower East Side of Manhattan is built according to these two tenement models based on the 1879 and 1887 tenement laws. So every time they change the law, they change the architecture. Here's the 1879 tenement law where you start to get bathrooms on every floor. And, a, and an air shaft right here. Um, a stair on one side, the bathrooms on the other, and air shafts. So now you can get light and air into these two rooms. These rooms, still you have to look across the dining room. Uh, the game here is all about satisfying the requirement that every bedroom and every occupiable large room, not the bathrooms, not the laundry rooms, not the closets, not the walk-in closets, but all bedrooms uh, have to have, and all, all main occupiable rooms have to have access to a window. That is still true today. So as you design your micro units, you cannot have uh, a bedroom tucked away from the windows. You can't have a dining area with a bed that's blocked from the window by a bedroom because bedrooms have closed doors. You can't have a living dining room kitchen that's set away from that light. Uh, that's why so often you see it, you walk into a unit, there's the kitchen, you're walking into the kitchen, then you have a dining area, then you have a living room, and then the far side of the living room you have a, a window. That satisfies the law. And that means that uh, that's about the maximum depth of a, live, of a residential unit. It's about 30 feet. And as narrow as you can make it. If you're going to make money for your greedy clients, your housing clients, that's, that's kind of the, the trick. That's kind of the puzzle that uh, many architects spend their entire careers uh, saving, shaving an inch off here, a foot off there, putting the living, uh, the bedroom space above the kitchen, and then leave the living room double height, 
all of these things. It's uh, an endless variation. Um, when I was an architecture student, this is the unit I lived in right here. In the midst of the drug wars in New York. Uh, here it is in section, uh, where you can have a store on the street front, and then uh, apartments stacked up. Typically, it's five stories, not four. And here are the conditions from Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives. And uh, after 1900, they passed laws that changed the lot size from 25 feet to 50 feet in order to get more light and air into the units. And here is uh, the Lower East Side uh, in, the, in the last decades. Um, this date is wrong. That should say 1879 um, to 1900. This is what the Lower East Side looked like. And then over the course of the 20th century, uh, through the forces of urban renewal, it turned into this. This was my project when I was an undergraduate. I, f I went to the library and photocopied all the insurance maps from the late 19th century and compared them with the same insurance maps from 1980s, uh, the 1970s. And this is um, the same place. And you can do a toggle. You can see the transformation. Here's a question. What's up with that? Why does the housing look so different? Why does the street block arrangement dominate everything here, and all of a sudden, 100 years later, it's cut loose, and these yellow buildings are floating in the middle of a sea of green? What is up with that? Great quiz question. You, you have some answers? Yeah. We were able to build higher. We were able to build higher. I'm saying they realized that they needed better air circulation. We needed air, better air circulation. So in a way, it's a logical extrapolation from what was happening before. Always, first of all, put those air shafts into the solid blocks of housing to get some light and air down five stories into the first floor. I lived on the first floor. Try to get that light and air down into those first floor through these tiny air shafts and then make them bigger and bigger and bigger and keep going until it's mostly air shaft and only a little bit of building left. But how do you uh, maintain the number of units as you do that? You go higher. So the rest of the lecture is looking at the history of that. So um, Tony Garnier, son of Charles Garnier. Who's Charles Garnier? Paris Opera House, did I hear? Yes. So his son won the Rome Prize. And instead of going off and sketching classical architecture in Rome the way he was supposed to, he went off and speculated on the new use of steel reinforced concrete. What would housing look like if we cast houses out of steel reinforced concrete? Brand new material. Uh, they had it in Rome, yes, you're right. Uh, I knew you were about to correct me. But then they forgot the recipe. And it wasn't until the late 19th century when they discovered the recipe for concrete again between Rome and uh, 19th century Europe no concrete. And so now it's a new material all over again. And, but the big thing about Tony Garnier, uh, son of Charles Garnier, is he says, listen, if our factories are going to spew all this smoke, let's set it apart from the living situation and use streetcars to connect the population from their residential quarters to the dirty factory quarters. So we can have clean residential quarters, upwind from the factories, and downwind uh, you can have the factories let the smoke blow away from the residential quarters. And by the way, that old town with all the narrow, crooked streets, just abandon it or preserve it, better yet, and build a new town next to it. And then leave lots of open space, but the buffer zone between all of these things, use that for all your infrastructure. 
your railways, and little did he know at that time, the motor car. And so this was the thing that took off, this idea of zoning. And it became really good at uh, producing, it became a very powerful tool for racial segregation. First used by the Nazis and then by uh, the victors over the Nazis in the post-war period. So here we go, Corbusier. This is really the last topic of the lecture, but Corbusier is such a giant, uh, just when it comes to housing, forget about his architectural, uh, his single family homes, you're gonna have a whole nother lecture to talk about uh, Corbusier's wonderful uh, architectural work uh, beyond multifamily housing. This lecture is only the Corbusier who's busy doing housing and using that vision of housing to create a new vision of cities. And there's a, a lot of uh, blowback saying Corbusier destroyed our cities uh, with his ideas. I think that is an excellent statement to debate. So here's the summary slide. Uh, it really all boils down to some version of this house. But wait, you just said you weren't gonna talk about the single house. Well, he first designed the single unit and then he agglomerated it. He put this house together in multiple versions, stacked it up and created entire cities out of it. So the, the DNA, the molecule, the building block of the, ha of the city is the individual unit. It starts with the house. So here we go. So remember that guy, Inard, who did that fantastical uh, uh, street section? Well, here he is uh, taking over from Hausman and coming up with this idea that uh, we love tree-lined streets, but you can't have all tree-lined streets. You also have to have housing uh, in the model of Hausman. Why not make the best of both worlds and combine the two? Have housing and then intersperse it with treed areas. Well, it's still not enough housing. So just make it look like you have uh, an apartment building, a park, apartment building, park as you go down the street, but actually have a continuous block of housing and just use this to create the appearance of a pleasant boulevard with a, a steady rhythm of beautiful apartment buildings and parks. Pretty clever. It's called arredan, or stepped street facade. Step, step steep street facade, step street wall should be in red, because that's kind of a big deal. So Corbusier did what all the architects uh, were doing, uh, taking a tour of Greece and Rome. And on his way back, uh, towards, uh, back towards Paris, he stopped in a valley for a week and took a break at this beautiful monastery. And it left a very deep impression. The impression it left on him, on him was so deep that we're taking time in this super packed lecture to look at it. You see it? The thing to notice is that the monks' cells are these two-story apartments that open onto these walled gardens. The most interesting question that Corbusier asked about this is where does the architecture stop and the site begin? It's so important and it's gonna be at the core of not just this lecture but the next lecture on Corbusier that I'm gonna ask that question again. It's also at the core of a lot of your studio work, I'm not sure which semester. At what point does the architecture stop and the site begin. So he sketched it and sketched it and sketched it and 
he came up with this, his, his interpretation of it is this pretty modest interior zone. As a matter of fact, this is even exterior. If, if we were talking about exterior as non-air conditioned spaces, this is a loggia. And this is the dwelling unit on two levels. Here it is in section. Uh, the loggia is overlooking the garden. And so these two-story spaces uh, inside and a two-story space outside with a balcony overlooking the two-story outdoor space. And here's the view over the railing. Very important uh, thing to Corbusier. It's also worth noting that this is the back and over the wall is the valley over the Emma Valley, the view across the valley. And on this side is the cloister. This side is a courtyard where all the social life of the monks occurs in the monastery. So this is the civilized urban side. This is the wild, natural landscape side, if there is such a thing. And so he internalizes this and obsessively repeats variations on it over and over and over again throughout his career right to the very end. And he carries it with him from 1907 when he takes this trip. He produces the Sichuan House, which is this. That's the Sichuan House. It's intended to be mass produced, thus the name Sichuan, which is a uh, it sounds a lot like it's a homonym of the automobile manufacturing company, Citroën. And so he did the uh, Maison Citroën. Uh, and later, he revised it ever so slightly for his new spirit uh, pavilion. And here we see the two-story living room space. Uh, some people call this the maisonette section, where the living room is double height. Um, there's a kitchen in the lower space here, and uh, the bedroom quarters is up here, but there's an, open, there's an open railing to really take advantage of the experience of that double height space. And that's inside here. It's repeated on an exterior portion. So here's uh, typically in many of his single family homes, he would put a balcony up here to overlook the two-story garden. But wait, is that a garden? Or is it part of the house? It's a garden with a roof over it, and then a hole stuck in the roof for a tree to grow through. Who's, who's ever seen that before? It's an extremely innovative thing. But again, I ask, where does the architecture stop and the site begin? By the way, that is a trick question. And since it's mass produced, let's make a whole bunch of them and stack them up. One version of this scheme he called uh, the furniture homes. He used this idea that you don't, you don't have designer furniture, you go to Ikea and you get standardized furniture. There's something refreshing about just getting something that's normal, that's just standard. It's an industrial mass produced lifestyle and aesthetic. And he was proposing that that extend to the architecture. If he were alive today, he would be working with Ikea to uh, have, just imagine the instructions when you come home from Ikea and you have to assemble one of these units. And then he started designing entire cities around these units. Um, he did multiple versions of the city. We're gonna emphasize his first one, 1922, the Ville Contemporaine, the contemporary city for three million people. And he has two types of housing. He has these 60-story high-rises, and when we see it in plan, you'll see uh, every piece of this high-rise is very thin. Because of why? Because your rooms have to have windows. It results in very thin chunks of building. And then these, uh, these things here, what do you recognize about this pattern? Let's look at it this way. On many of his plans, he doesn't footnote uh, Eugene Enard, but he says 
Boulevard Arredon. These are stepped wall street facades directly taking the best of what Eugene Ennard proposed uh, a decade earlier or two decades earlier. And so he's taking these ideas and this is the footprint. He's creating these mass produced houses built in a factory, shipped to the site, lifted into place and to create this new city for three million people. Um, you start to see, if you can see the detail, the tiny like radiator fin like character of these 60 story uh, towers. Uh, because you had to have light into every living space, you couldn't have residential units that are deeper, much deeper than about 10 meters. Or, what is that in American? About 30 feet. And so you have a combination of these two strategies, the Redon strategy, the stepped uh, wall facade, street wall strategy, and the cruciform point tower, 60 stories high. And later, he, took, he added this idea from Tony Garnier of functional zoning. And he said, there are four functions of the city. The city has to work like a machine. The city as a machine. He said, uh, well, I won't say this. I have to save something for Christina when she gives a lecture on Corbusier. But uh, he decided to make the city machine-like. He identified these four functions. What are the four functions? Dwelling, working, recreating, and circulating. So these are the four functions. And he separates them away from each other. He puts living away from working so that you don't get the pollution. We still have zoning even though we know it's wrong. The newest zoning is to create a new zone that allows everything to get mixed, mixed use zonings. A lot of us say, just get rid of the goddamn zoning, and we can't. The law is too thick and heavy, so we add more zoning on top of the old zoning to create a situation that is closely uh, replicates the situation if we have no zoning. And jumping ahead to 1947, we get to uh, the unité d'habitation, the united dwelling tower block, where this is uh, in exposed concrete. What's the French word for exposed concrete? Who speaks French? What's concrete? So beton is concrete. Beton brut, B-R-U-T, is exposed concrete. So when you think of that style of architecture that Mark Pasnick is always uh, talking about, what's that style of architecture called? Brutalism. It's not called brutalism because we want to make fun of it at recess, because it's so ugly. No, it's a technical term. It's from the French, beton brut. It happens to work very well if you want to make fun of it at recess. Just call it brutal and advocate for tearing it down as quickly as possible. But know when you do that, that that's not how it got the name. It's beton brut uh, talism, right? It's raw concrete. And so this building, was uh, one of the great uh, early 
um, expressions of exposed concrete. Here's uh, the ground plane. It's lifted up off the ground to free up the ground plane. And uh, the, the horizontal space of the roof is recaptured as a recre recreational area. Um, it has something called a street in the air. Corbusier did two things. First, he said, let's get rid of these street walls altogether. We don't want these narrow streets with walls on either side. We want wide open spaces. We want motorways cutting through the landscape. Who's with me? Motorways cutting through the landscape with some buildings in the distance. And that's how we got towers in the park. These are towers in the park. This is the poster for the towers in the park approach to housing and urban form. I should put that in the caption, shouldn't I? Why wasn't that ever realized, the contemporary city? Why wasn't it ever realized? Let me get back to you on that. The unité d'habitation, or the unified dwelling, had a, a street in the air where you could go to the dentist, you could get your dry cleaning. It was like a phalanstere. It was like one of these utopian socialist communities where the services are in the building itself. Fourier is, Corbusier was definitely influenced by the ideas of the utopian socialists, Charles Fourier, Robert Owen, the other people at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, and so he had this idea of streets in the air, which was picked up later by another group of architects who we're not going to talk about today. And then who's done streets in the air lately? Stephen Hull uh, did it in Beijing, and he called it streets in the air. He should have looked at this and saw what worked and didn't work, but he didn't. Um, but here's an interesting section that this is a very famous, this is one of the most famous uh, section drawings in modern architecture. Uh, it's all about when you, when you get into designing domestic spaces or any space, your employer, if he, if he or she hasn't already done this in your co-op, uh, will say, um, what is the usable space to circulation ratio? What is the net to gross ratio of your floor plan? Our floor plans in the profession of architecture are judged on the efficiency of their layout. The more circulation you have, the less efficient, the more money you're asking your clients to spend on just getting people from point A to point B, and they think of that as a waste of space. Sometimes it's the best space, oftentimes it is the best space, um, but it is a factor. You should have a keen awareness of what the ratio of usable space and uh, circulation space is in your apartment designs, in your uh, family housing, your single family housing, in your urban designs. What is the ratio of streets to other things? So what's special about this? You've had a chance to look at it a bit now. What's special? Yes, the apartments are all double height. They interlock. Let's see if I can move it. They interlock like, I don't know if you can do that, right? But it is. That might look like one. It's a very, they're interlocking. And is that more efficient? You know how much it costs to stop an elevator just for the doors and all that stuff? You know how much space and money it takes to put in a corridor? If you tell me that uh, I'm cutting your corridor expenses in your building by two thirds, uh, I'm the happiest client you've ever you've ever seen. So this is a brilliant solution. Um, but again, how come people don't do this? In some places they do 
not sure I, I rode my bicycle past the McLaren building this morning. I think that does a skip stop something. I think that might be one of the places. You know the McLaren building by Nada or Office Da? Um, so you get it. I don't have to show it anymore. Does this influence your approach to your in-class exercise? I mean, it's an interesting innovation. And, that's, and then you can take some of that extra circulation space and do things like this. So Corbusier was uh, an extremely successful architect. And he didn't just do it alone. He, he got together with his colleagues. And I could go down the list. Um, but you're going to be studying them for the rest of the semester. People like Mies that you've already heard of, Mies van der Rohe, and lots of other people who you may have heard of, like Walter Gropius, and lots of other people you haven't heard of yet. They were all part of this uh, post-World War I housing exhibition. There was a big housing crisis in Europe between World War I and World War II. There was a big struggle to build enough housing to house the growing populations of Europe. And so they hired architects to come up with prototype houses, some of them that could be mass produced using industrial, labor saving, money saving methods of prefabrication. And so this famous exhibition of 1927, so famous that it's in red. You should have. Uh, this as something you can talk about uh, at the client meeting and at parties. And they did this in part through social condensers. So a lot of what the rest remains here is the idea of social condensers. So it wasn't enough to do this exhibition that got all these guys together in Stuttgart, Germany. They also formed the International Congress of Modern Architecture. And because it had a French name, and why did it have a French name? Because Corbusier was uh, the powerful founder of this organization. Uh, they use the French name to create the acronym SIAM. Not the former name of Thailand, the uh, International Congress of Modern Architecture, SIAM. Who's heard of SIAM before? OK. I wouldn't expect you to, but now you've heard of it. From this point forward, every instructor, every colleague you ever meet will assume that you know what they, what they mean when they say Siam. So Siam met for the first time in 1928, and they said, let's tackle this problem of minimal housing. It was the micro unit problem that you have in your hands. But they were looking at it in 1928. They wanted to identify a very high quality, but very small and very uh, inexpensive to build form of housing to solve the problems of the world. They kept meeting year after year. At the third one, they were going to do it in Moscow, but didn't work out so well. Um, so they got on a boat uh, in Marseille, France, and took the boat to Athens. And they worked out uh, a set of formulations, a set of guidelines for producing a functional city. So they moved to see what they did. They went on from idealized housing as their focal point to the, uh, the city that is created by housing. Because most of the built fabric of a city uh, is made up of what? Housing. You design housing. You design the way it goes together. And you are de facto designing the streets. Some would say, and I'm going to say it now, you should design the streets you want first then you should design the housing type that will create the streets that the city needs. 
That's not this in class exercise. That's for maybe if you go into the urbanism concentration. Um, that's what you'll do in that course. So on this boat, they worked out the guidelines for a functional city, and part of that was a very strict isolation and segregation of different functions. So residential zoning to keep it away from industrial zoning. Uh, and you have a downtown area where the father goes to work in the morning and comes back in the evening, and after five o'clock on Friday, it goes dead, right? Does this sound familiar? So residential segregation, in, uh, and so after World War II, every major city in Europe had to rebuild its city center because it was bombed by the war. So the war ended in 44, and what are you gonna do? You gotta rebuild your cities, and your cities are your source of national identity, and your cities are your machinery of social construction and economic growth. Who are you gonna call? The architects. And the architects are gonna show up and say, okay, I'm ready to take your fee, but uh, the architects need to also know what to do. They need some guidance on how to rebuild these cities. We've never rebuilt the cities uh, after a war, like on this scale. So what do we do? We uh, publish the outcome of SIAM 3. Remember, they took a boat from Marseille to Athens. When they arrived in Athens, they had worked out a series of guidelines for the modern city. Corbusier and a few others edit it heavily, and they, in, in the process, they inject a lot of Corbusier's ideas into the Athens Charter. If it wasn't there already, they pumped it in there. So basically, the main author of the Athens Charter is Corbusier. It gets published in 1943, it's in the bookstores, uh, in a bookstore near you. By the time that war ends, the Marshall Plan, the United States has a lot of money, and it gives it to Europe. Uh, and in the United States, what are we doing in the United States after World War II? Ask your grandparents. Did your grandparents tell you what happened in the United States after World War II? What was it? The baby boom, suburbanization. What happened in the cities? Well, the cities had not been developed much and improved much. It's also hard to improve cities because there's so much stuff you gotta move out of the way before you improve it. So step one, spend a lot of money bulldozing the city. So we bulldozed a lot of cities, including Boston, including the Wentworth campus, or the area around Wentworth campus. And then what do you do? So, so now you have empty cities. You've moved all the rubble to the, to the landfill. You've done that in Europe, all the cities of Europe, and you've done that in all the cities in North America. So you have lots of open space in cities. So now what do you do? you open up the Athens Charter and you get to work. And in the process, you build public housing. You segregate functions. But what else can you segregate in the post-war period in the United States while you're at it? People, let's segregate the people. So anyone who wanted to, and anyone who wanted to move to the suburbs after World War II in the United States, could get a loan and cheap housing and a cheap car and a cheap education, especially if you're coming home from war, it was actually cheaper to move out of Boston than it was to stay in Boston. So anybody who wanted to could leave Boston, unless you weren't white. If you weren't, if you weren't white, then you had to stay in the city. So what happened? to the tax base, what happened to the school system, and where are we today? It will take us another hundred years 
if ever, to repair the damage of what happened after World War II in the United States, and some a different version of that happened in Europe. Um, so why didn't we, so back to the question, why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do this? How come we never built this? Notice the nature of the, the footprint of the buildings on the blocks. It turns out we did build it. There it is. It's not exactly the same design, right? It's not exactly the same shape, but these are towers in the park. This is a, uh, as direct an application of a big architectural idea as the world has ever seen. So they bulldozed much of uh, my old neighborhood. This was my apartment right there. Uh, they, bulldozed, they bulldozed as much as they could, and they built towers in the parks. They started out with low-rise uh, radon, the diagonal radon scheme here, and a step radon plan here. But then after World War II, you can, the, there are little dates on each of these blocks. You can see how the, the thinking changed. The buildings got higher and higher. The amount of open space became more and more. And what do you think is in there? Do you think it's grasses and parks? What do you think's in there? Besides grass and playgrounds. Parking, yes. The automobile came into being, and it took up so much space that who knew? When you go to design a building, uh, an office building, one of the first things you'll ask the client is how many employees? And you'll say, and he'll say 80 employees, and you'll take out your little chart and you'll say 80 employees, 350 square feet gross per employee. That's enough for the corridors and the fire exits and the elevators and the, the break room and the, the kitchenette. The cubicle is only like a fraction, tiny fraction of that. But you take 80 employees, you multiply it by 350 square feet, and you stack it up in, a, in an office tower. Then you ask the question, how many people will drive? And uh, the employer, the client will say, what do you mean? Everybody. And so you'll take 80, and you'll multiply that by how much per car for the parking? Does anyone know? 450 square feet. And can you stack that? Eh, you can, but it's so expensive. You, you really can't. Not even Wentworth can. So, um, so the answer to the question, why didn't we ever build this? Uh, we did build it. If you look out the window here, can you see? Imagine a window here. Look across the parking lot. Uh, Public housing in the United States uh, between the 50s and 70s is basically based on the uh, tower in the park model. So now, what we need to do, and so we, the problems, I'm going to make a big bold statement that will define your careers. You ready? The problems of the 21st century are the result of the solutions of the 20th century. Is that okay? Did you get that? 
the problems we have in the problems I don't have it the problems you have in this century sorry about that are a direct result of the fact that we were so damn successful in the 20th century that we couldn't predict all the problems who knew that the planet would die who knew I, who could have seen that coming who knew that cars would take over who knew that it would be a problem to move wealth out of cities and abandon inner city school districts? Who knew that it would be a problem to have downtown areas that go dead at five o'clock and stay dead until Monday morning at nine? Who knew that would be a problem? How did, how did, how, we, I, I, who? I didn't know that was gonna happen. Sorry about that. Good luck, right? So that's, that's the deal that you've drawn, sorry, but that's the way it works. So a big part of your career is understanding this whole thing, because some of it worked, don't get me wrong, we cured diseases, we produced the greatest increase in wealth in human history, we, uh, developed education, science, and med especially medicine, beyond anybody's wildest dreams, we even went to the moon, right? So the accomplishments are unparalleled. This takes nothing away from all of those great things, or at least most of them. I would, wouldn't mind living in a world without nuclear weapons, but it's a package deal, apparently. But what are you gonna do with the bad parts of this package deal? It helps to understand how we got here. Here's one thing that deals directly with housing. These utopian socialist ideas uh, are not gone. They still exist. There's this thing, there's this Danish architect, he went to architecture school at Harvard in the 60s. And he went home to Denmark and he said, you know what we need? because the single family house is not a good thing. And apartment living is also kind of bad, it's so isolated. What we need is need something more. And he probably took that course at Harvard where they learned all about Charles Fourier's Falanste and all the social utopian. He probably sat in a seat like you're in and heard this, a similar lecture and he said, I bet we can figure out an architecture and social arrangement that can improve on this isolation of the four functions. And so he said the word co-housing. Who's heard of the word co-housing? So I have to be careful at this point because I'm a true believer. I live in a co-housing community. I was one of the founding members of Cambridge Co-Housing that started in 1997 when I was a graduate student. Crazy. Uh, and I still live there. My two children were born there. And it has been uh, mostly great, sometimes horrible, because, uh, well, you'll see. And so um, in 1988, two architects went to Denmark they said, oh, cool, ID, and they, and they came back, they wrote a book, and uh, nine years later, we were moving in, and it is another social condenser. Did we talk about what a social condenser is? I bet you can guess. If you lived in a really, really, really small unit where you close the door and that's your private thing, you would probably miss not having a foosball table or a widescreen TV or a couch, right? So what do you have in the dorms? What do you have? You have lounges. And do any of you live in a suite? So that's kind of a social condenser. You have your own little private space, but then you go out and Instead of each one of you living in your own place with your own kitchen and your own bathroom, you've employed a social condenser logic and you share a bathroom, you share a kitchen. Is it, is it all wonderful? No, Jimmy keeps eating my, my yogurt. I label it clearly, why does he take my yogurt? What is his problem, right? It's not all great. 
But what if you expanded that and took that logic and spread it further, especially if housing got to be really expensive, especially if you graduated and you had student loans but you wanted to work in a design profession in a big city, but even in Fort Point Channel, uh, these tiny little units, it's still really expensive. Well, maybe if you make things smaller and smaller, uh, you can still have these things, but at a certain point, it's too small. I think I'm gonna go crazy unless I can get out and do something with some other people that I know. Thus is born and reborn every generation, the idea of the social condenser. Sh by sharing amenities, you can get more for less. And that's been um, a secret of things that happen in co-housing. We bought the land, we designed it, and we built it. And in the process of doing all that, we drove some people crazy, only a few lawsuits. Uh, some people left and we lost some friendships. But those of us who stuck with it, man, we're solid. In it's legally, it's a condominium. Uh, in an unusual condominium, you would minimize the sharing and maximize the privacy. This co-housing community, you maximize the sharing, minimize uh, the private space. So people have smaller units, probably, is the idea. You also share things like a shop. I could never have a shop, but now I have a shop. Uh, you build things together. You self-manage, you self-maintain. This is my son. He might be going to school here next year. Uh, you make decisions by consensus. Isn't he cute? You make decisions by consensus. So it's not majority rules. If one person has a problem with it, you listen to what they have to say, and you figure out how to accommodate that one person. So it's inclusive. It's a model for a new political system. And architecturally, it's very interesting. So all of a sudden, it's more than just the collection of these tiny little units, like your micro unit exercise in front of you. Uh, now it becomes a much more interesting thing that these, these larger chunks of program can help you turn corners where it's difficult to put windows, et cetera. And just in case you don't know what a micro unit is, uh, it's something that came up that's a very big thing. Mayor Menino loves, well, we don't have him anymore, but he loved it. And um, Fort Point Channel, there was a new development category developed uh, to allow micro units because they are smaller than uh, the minimum code requirements for a residential unit. Um, you've all heard of micro units? So let's take a minute and do this exercise. Um, it's important that you do this and turn it in uh, because I don't always see everybody's face in the pictures I take. So it's actually a useful thing for you to turn it in. Do you have any questions about that? Some of you have been here and not turned in your paper. Right? Uh, it'd be great if um, you always turn it in with your with your name on it. Some of